All right. So welcome, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon, good evening to everyone who is joining at different time zones. And welcome to our webinar uh, on data ethics principles. I am extremely proud and, and, and pleased to introduce today um, the group of speakers and experts on this very hot topic um, we have with us, Sobia Akram and Anna Dolinsky from Novo Nordisk. Welcome, ladies. Very happy to have you. We also have John Orwell from Novartis. Hello, John. And then from GSK. And last but not least, Jeff Scott from Pfizer. Welcome, speakers and experts. It's a pleasure. And first of all, I want to thank you again because you guys have been driving this over many, many months and <laughs> had to put up with a lot of reiterations and some of you were not used to the association way of working and it takes sometimes longer than in a company because we have such a diverse membership but you all, all were so very patient and so very professional and I thank you for that on behalf of the IFPMA. It's been a wonderful journey and we will um, summarize the journey exactly uh, where we started and where we ended uh, as well today as part of the webinar. So without further ado, I will just quickly summarize a few housekeeping rules. It's not really necessary anymore because everyone is used to webinars right now, but if you could always mute yourself, that would be great. If you have a question, please feel free to use the chat box. We also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so you can also ask your question there. The idea is that we will issue a Q&A document at the end or after um, the webinar. I mean, just <laughs> bear with us, give us maybe a few, a few weeks to finalize that because uh, that is something that we will pub, pub, uh, publish on our website. So that is, I think, an important question. And that also means that if your question, if you did not have the occasion to ask your question during the webinar, feel free to send me that question after the webinar and we will work with the experts and the speakers uh, of today to find the right answer. Um, if you're not speaking, please disable your video function and also to notify everyone that we are recording the meeting uh, because we want to publish the content of the webinar also on our uh, homepage and of course we need it um, to then issue this uh, Q&A document. So that is it from my side and with that I would like to hand over to you Subia to um, guide us through the objectives of today. Thank you. Yes and thank you um, Sophie both for the kind words and uh, the introduction and hello everybody. I hope I can't see how many were online but I hope there is a lot of people uh, following um, what we have to uh, share with all of you today. Um, so um, with the kickoff that Sophie has been kind enough to uh, provide with us, what I would like to share with you is uh, just a brief background on sort of the journey that we've been with, uh, we've been at uh, for the last uh, many months actually. And uh, just briefly before I jump into that, uh, what we will share with you today is, of course, uh, apart from the process that we've had, uh, also um, a short introduction on why we think this is relevant. And I, obviously, I think all of you share our opinion since you're uh, tuning in on today's session. And then, of course, we will deep dive into, in a brief way, uh, what the contents uh, of what we have um what we've been working on, what that looks like, what's the outcome, and, and how do we propose to implement the principles that we have drafted so far. And of course, there will be some time allocated for Q&A and discussion. So that's basically the expectations of today, the content of today's session. So if I can ask you to um, flip to the next slide, thank you. A few highlights on a journey that started uh, quite a while back. Uh, actually, uh, we discussed it in um, our eBIG group in IFPMA already uh, back in Q3, Q4 of 2019, where we agreed that it would make sense to really start up uh, a journey and a working group uh, cross, uh, you can say cross industry wide, looking at whether we could form some agreed upon principles uh, with regards to data ethics. And I'd like to share with you just some highlights on the process we've had. In Q4, we established a working stream, a working group, and then we started in early January of last year. So we've been at it for a year and a half, and I can't believe, though it has been, uh, as you say, a lot of work, it's been fun work and really educational, I think, for all of us that have been in the working group. And of course, we started 
educating ourselves, uh, not maybe all of us being fully tech savvy. And you need some kind of tech savviness in order to draft principles uh, that can be applied across many different stakeholder groups and functional groups uh, within and across the industry. Um, so uh, as, as our education journey started, uh, of course, we started reviewing also what are the existing frameworks, what were the proposed frameworks. There were no really fully complete, very few fully complete suggestions on what a framework, uh, framework could look like. And so we started a desk research process, you can say, and a screening research process. And then we also started um, uh, a dialogue uh, in order to inform ourselves. So we started a dialogue with whom we consider the experts to be. Uh, so input from regulators, advocates uh, towards uh, forming data eth ethics principles, and also um, other, uh, we also talked and tapped into other industries to get an idea of where they were. Um, to give you an, in, uh, an example, we looked into the telecommunications industry. Where are they at uh, with regards to data ethics principles? And um, some of the, uh, to give you an idea of regulators and advocates, we brainstormed with entities such as ICO, um, dataethics.eu, um, and um, different types of uh, different types of consultants as well, working on supporting and assisting companies and associations such as our own uh, to form or start the work around drafting data ethics principles. Uh, and then, of course, we also in our, each of our entities, we took a tour around internal stakeholders uh, to uh, to reach out and hear what are the considerations, what are the thoughts, what are some of uh, some of the uh, the wishes maybe also, and what are some of the challenges or worries uh, that our different uh, colleagues across might have. And based on, you can say, this education journey, the uh, um, the uh, desk research, the screening, and all these different dialogues that we had started up, we started drafting principles. And of course, then just as Sophie says, we had a lot of back and forth, a lot of calibration uh, and socializing uh, internally uh, within, um, you can say, within our EBIX or IFPMA world. And I would say we also socialized actually internally, tested out the principles with some of our internal stakeholders within each of our respective entities. Um, so that's what, what we started in uh, by the end of, uh, oh, during Q1 of this year actually. So the internal um, road testing in member entities. Since then, once we had received feedback and uh, again calibrated, um, then we moved on to also start a dialogue with some of our collaboration partners across, you can say so, entities such as WHO, for instance, to align because they are also they have also embarked on this journey and it makes sense. It makes sense uh, from the beginning to try and align uh, on the uh, overarching or high level principles uh, so that we can all sort of start the journey uh, together uh, once we all move into launch mode. And that's where we are now. So basically, uh, this is uh, this has been for me personally. Uh, nearly two years of considerations and thoughts. Uh, and I'm so happy that we're here now because I think uh, it's overdue. We really need to move the needle and I'm really happy and proud to be part of an industry where we're on the forefront. Uh, in fact, uh, compared to many of our, many of our um, cross sectoral colleagues in private industry and in associations. A brief word about what's coming up next. Uh, what there will be a chapter two on this, and we have started that journey also, where we will hone in on, you can say maybe an addendum uh, to the data ethics principles, which are overarching and which will be presented to you in just a few seconds. And the addendum will contain uh, a deep dive or a, a more specific lens on AI ethics. Uh, AI is a very big part, I think, of everybody's world already now. So it does it does deserve a little bit of extra attention. So you can stay tuned for that work coming up. Um, I think uh, that's basically it. That's what I want to share about our process up until now. And then I will hand it over. 
All right. So, 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 hi. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Scott. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I sit in uh, Pfizer's corporate compliance organization, and I'm going to talk uh, briefly about uh, the rationale for uh, creating the data ethics principles. I'm not sure I need to sell uh, anyone on this call of the importance of this, but uh, I'm going to at least lay out why we're why we're here. Um, you know, I think. I don't think it's lost on anyone uh, that over the past year, um, uh, if more than it, more than any time before, uh, that uh, you know our industry's uh, great responsibility to patients and society, it, you know, was it, it was clear. Um, you know, in order to fulfill that responsibility, we have always put you know trust um, and the building of trust at the core of our ethos, which you know it's evident. Uh, by the IFPMA, you know, uh, the infographic there. Um, but we also know that, you know, trust and in our experience that trust is often difficult to build and maintain in, a, in, a, in our complex industry. And I would I would suggest that, uh, you know, um, you know, the ever importance, uh, the ever growing importance of data actually makes it more challenging uh, to maintain and build that trust. Um, you know, the appropriate collection of data um, it is not an easy concept to always, and, and use of data is not always an easy concept to, to grasp, right? Um, because, you know, from outside an organization, how, uh, you know, a, a certain entity does all this may be very opaque to patients and society at, at large. Um, that complexity and confusion in this space certainly leaves open the risk that uh, trust could be easily lost um, or eroded uh, with 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 the use of data, and I would I would say that you know even the appearance of the inappropriate use of data could really quickly damage that trust. And I give one ex one recent example that showed up in the press. Um, Amazon uh, recently was it was reported that uh, the employment data that they would report to the U.S. government showed a, a large increase in the number of uh, diverse executives uh, that they had. Um, but that increase wasn't due to uh, new hiring, but how they've reclassified employee data. Um, that may have been a very justifiable uh, change in how they classified that data, but it was reported in the press uh, as more of a data manipulation uh, plot on Amazon's part, right? Um, and so that's just one example of how quickly, uh, you know, the, these complex issues when kind of viewed through the lens of society uh, could, could start eroding trust uh, very, very quickly. Um, so maybe go to the next build, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, our industry's unique position, uh, we, you know, obviously I think you'd feel like with those types of issues that uh, is crucial to, to kind of put such guiding principles out there around how we use data ethics to show uh, patients and society that we are committed to fairness, accountability, transparency in this space. Um, maybe go to the next slide. Um, you know, the need for data ethics principles, though, extends beyond the need to support our own core values, right? Um, and I would also say that the ubiquity and importance of data and the opportunities that it presents also is a strong reason for uh, uh, needing data ethics principles, right? I think uh, it's not lost on anyone that uh, data is at the heart of the innovation that we that our industry does, right? I mean, and this is just one example from University of California about the use of data in in, in cancer research, but you know we have countless examples uh, from COVID nineteen and beyond that, um, and so there there are lots of opportunities in the in the R and D space. The commercialization of our innovations also relies so much on data. I may go to the next build, Sophie. Um, but it extends beyond that too. There are opportunities that, and this is a, a example from a, a, a trade publication in the HR space, that data will also kind of transform how we inter, you know, interact with our own our own colleagues within our organizations as well. Um, so for these reasons, you know, with all this opportunity and 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 the use of data go forward. It, certainly from a practical perspective, um, represents another reason to, for the data ethics principles uh, for our industry. And then maybe go to the next build, Sophie. Um, yeah, at the same time, I think it's not lost to anyone as well that there is increasing scrutiny and enforcement uh, from both regulators and society at large. Um, I think, you know, 
you know, a lot of a lot of focus and, and a lot of focus of the principles that you'll see are around uh, data privacy issues and and uh, but it extends beyond that not that that might not be the most important issue that we'll face here um, this financial times article i think is an example of how uh, some other data issues may come into the the sites of regulators here this is a potential action by uk regulators looking at i'm not trying to pick on amazon but another amazon issue uh, where amazon has used data that it collects on its the, on the third parties that sell on its platform. And the allegation is that Amazon is then using that data to uh, gain advantage for it when it competes against those sellers on its own. So another use of, uh, you know, potential use of data. And then, you know, I think in addition to regulatory scrutiny, societal scrutiny at large, I think is gonna last in the, the foreseeable future. It's hard to imagine uh, many issues in the, in the future that don't have some component uh, of data at, you know, at their heart or, 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 or at least in an adjacent space that, that impacts that issue and, and that's, facing, that's facing our societies. Um, this example is, you know, the U.S. government's rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine. You know, questions about the private uh, channels that used all the data they collected about patients, right, and why they were doing that. So, uh, again, you know, hot, hot topic, obviously, a hot issue facing everyone, every country in the world, and in the data that's being collected along the way. Um, so, in, in you know, summation, so I'm sure people want to get to the the actual uh, principles themselves. Um, you know, because of the 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 importance of of uh, trust and how difficult it will be uh, to maintain trust, but also the opportunities that we have and the enforcement and scrutiny that that may present itself are all reasons why I think we we launched this this effort. So. Happy to pause for a second before moving on for any any questions. I think I we did, I did see a hand there uh, from somebody. Jeff, while we, I think we had it. Sorry, I think someone didn't have it there. Raise their hand. Sorry. Uh, maybe not. I don't know, Anna. Sorry. That's fine. While we organize ourselves and figure out when we will ask uh, questions from the audience, uh, Jeff, one of the things that we talked a lot about during the drafting of these principles is, do are we ready to move now? We have enforcement activities uh, in various uh, jurisdictions. We also have some new laws and regulations coming up. In general, you could say the field is moving very fast. Why do we take a stand now? Why should we come out with this document now rather than wait a little bit and see how the context uh, and expectations develop? Yeah, and that's a great question. I think that's a question that will always present itself when when tackling a new area. And I think the reason to act now, I think, uh, as I kind of discussed, I mean, I think both from the opportunities that present itself to, to the industry and the scrutiny and, and both from a regulatory and societal perspective definitely weigh in favor of it. But more than anything, I think the um, the possibility that without developing more trust with patients and society in this space, that we as an industry will erode the, that great goodwill that we may have developed over the last year uh, with some of the innovations that we brought um, is it, very real. I think it, it's 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 a it's a difficult space to to comprehend, and without kind of you know drawing a line in the sand, um, I think we're losing it. We're missing an opportunity. That's not to say that we won't have to adapt in the future. I think if you look at some other areas that EBIC tackles, like speaker programs, I, we've been adapt. We've been we've been uh, adapting along the way for for a decade or more. And that will probably be the same here in this space as, as things unfold. But I think that you know now is the time to kind of move forward and be at the forefront uh, of this space that Sobia had kind of uh, had, had, had mentioned. And maybe it's also worth noting that uh, we do have an opportunity to influence to some extent how the regulatory space around this evolves. I think it's very fair to say that we will continue iterating the principles because things are developing so fast, our data uses and technology, and so we can expect that the principles will not necessarily be fit for purpose. I think the, the timeline between this version and the next version is maybe shorter than it has been for some of the other principled or guidance documents IFPME has issued in the past. Uh, at the same time, we hopefully can engage with regula regulators in the space to at least uh, have some influence on the discussions. Sophia, I don't know if we're taking questions now or later or saving them in the chat, but perhaps we uh, move on to uh, what the data ethics principles are. 
I would say let's let's first look into what they are and then we can take questions after that. Thanks, Anna. Over to you, um, Uma. Hello, I'm Uma Swaminathan from GlaxoSmithKline. I head the R&D Bioethics and Policy team, so I'm very happy and honored to be here. So what is data ethics? First, I would like to emphasize on the words principles and guardrails as opposed to rules or regulations which are black and white, you know, do this, do that. Jeff, Sobia, they spoke about the IFPMA ethos of care, fairness, respect, honesty, which applies to data as well. So it is just principles that enable support, responsible and sustainable use of data. And since data is everywhere, we cannot overemphasize the importance of principles in this age. Why are we doing it? Always being mindful that the owner of the data, the patients who provide the data, we have a responsibility towards them and society to do the right thing. And this is in the field of data privacy, data integrity, data security, and respecting human rights and personal data protection. So keeping the individual at the center, but recognizing that these principles have benefits beyond the individual for both for science and society as well. Sophie, can you just go to the next bill? Thank you. So the scope of data here is very wide, which is also, I would say, the beauty of the IFPMA data ethics principles because they can be applied in multitude of situations. So it includes all types of data that is, you know, collected, analyzed, processed, stored by pharmaceutical companies. And the first thought that comes obviously is individual data individual data which is identifiable or you you know anonymize it you aggregate it but contrary to just looking at data in clinical trials or real world data it equally applies even to employee data healthcare professionals or even data that you can get you know from sales from non-scientific engagement so the scope is really broad but then what about data which at first sight it looks like it does not pertain to an individual but if processing of such data could have an impact in terms of you know, benefit or risk to individual or society, then those would also be in scope of data ethics principles. So it's really any type of data. It's a wide scope. And as I said before, it is the applicability of these principles that make it uni uniquely positioned to support organizations in this journey. Next slide, please. So now moving into the seven IFPMA data ethics principles. The first one is autonomy. Always respecting the individual choice. The individual is at the center, respecting their privacy, protecting their rights. This is this should be part of the process and the things we explain to them and how we handle data. Transparency. We do what we say we will do. And we say what we will be doing in a clear, simple language so that they understand what their rights are, what steps we take to protect it, why we will use the data, how, for what purposes. And if there are limitations, sometimes there are legal limitations which we need to comply with. It is stated up front so that there are no nasty surprises for the provider of the data at a later stage. Data quality. We have heard before, you know, data is such a catalyst for innovation, but equally suboptimal, inaccurate, incomplete data can completely derail trust and it can disable innovation. So keeping the quality at the center, thinking upfront of the risks of, you know, poor quality and building in mitigations. Prevention is better than cure, but sometimes what happens if you have, you know, encountered bad quality data immediately having processes to really you know, stem the damage, curtail the damage, document the corrective measures that are taken. Fairness and non-discrimination. For me, this is all about inclusion, diversity, representativeness in the decisions we make, how we acquire data. Human beings are creatures of bias. Whether we like it or not, we all have you know, an element of positive bias, less positive bias. The more diverse the panel is, and if you have a representative panel on which decides on the technology to be used, how data will be used, we minimize the extent of harmful bias. And also for technology, really quantifying the potential biases, being aware of them upfront puts us in a better position
to be able to mitigate those risks. Ethics by design. I must confess this is a favorite of mine because you know controls to prevent risks and harms. They are built into the data processing design and architecture. Data ethics is not a nice to have element that we look at the end and tick the box. It is something that we integrate in our technology, people, ways of working in the mindset right from the beginning. This can be in terms of how we anonymize the data, all the guardrails we put for who is accountable, how we protect it, and also if things go wrong, how do we take accountability for it and correct you know, those breaches? Responsible data sharing. This is again another important principle. Always considering protecting individual rights. No two ways about it. Data acquisition should always be through legitimate means. There must be accountable people to share the data or to protect it, to guard it. It's not, you know, free for all. And also we are just here not talking about the member company. We all work with innumerable third parties, partnering with them, ensuring that they also abide by these principles, standards and requirements. And data interoperability activities also should build in responsible data sharing. Again, it all comes back to the provider of the data, the individual at the center. Last but not the least, responsibility and accountability. These principles are great. The intent is not that we, you know, we go away, frame these principles and continue you know, as is. The effectiveness of these principles is how easily can we operationalize it, integrate it into our day to day activities. And there is no you know, one single magic answer for that. It is a series of things we bring in together. It is in the form of governance. It's in the form of policies and standards. It's in the form of training. It's in the form of you know, monitoring activities to make sure that things are happening as they should be disciplinary sanctions as well. And outlining all this, the senior management sponsorship and tone at the top is critical so that they lead the way, they walk the talk, they talk the walk, and they set the scene for the rest of the organization to follow. So this is you know, a sort of a whirlwind tour of the data ethics principles and what data are in scope. Now John will be taking us on some considerations on how we can actually implement it in practice. Uma, before we move off from the what mm -hmm. and into the how, you mentioned that ethics by design is maybe your favorite, um, but is there one principle that you could say is more important than all the rest? Honestly, no. Depending on where the organization is, a principle could be more important to them where they are you know, in that journey. And because these principles would be effective individually, as well as if you mix and collectively, you can, they can take, for example, today I can say, oh, I have to put more emphasis on monitoring. That doesn't mean the other principles are not important. It's because you know they are running well, and this could change as well in the journey. I say ethics by design because it you know forces in a positive way that thinking and mindset shift from the beginning, so that it acts as a glue for the other principles. So yeah, I would say you know that. It can it depends on where we are in the organization. That would be my answer to that. Thank you, and I think that's a really nice segue into John's presentation because you could also say that at different points at a different uh, depending on the maturity level of the organization, some will be more challenging. And so the question arises, how do you actually embed these data ethics principles and how do you operationalize them in your organization? It Thank, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Uma and Anna, for the great uh, presentation and leading us now into the question of how do we embed data ethics into our organization. I think, to to be uh, quite frank, this is uh, uh, this is always a very challenging component, um, uh, and we are just here presenting some of the thoughts uh, for each and every organization to consider uh, based on on their level or based on their maturity in the journey of uh, integrating data uh, principles or ethic principles on the way they, they are operating. So the first uh, area, if you could just move forward, um, is educating on how do you foster the literacy around data ethics in the organization? Because 
for you to be able to, for any organization to be able to, to leave the principles, there need to be awareness. And that awareness is, is usually very important, not only at the operational level, but also with the top management and integrating that actually into the culture uh, of the organization. Because the more people in the organization, the more the employees, the more the associates, the more the partners to the organization are comfortable with the topic and talking about the topic, the easier it will be for them to integrate that into their ways of working, into their operations. So the other way, of course, is training and capability building. So you create awareness, but of course, you will realize that there need to be more formal trainings around the subject, because when it comes to, more, to the implementation, then it becomes very detailed, and then it becomes about really embedding that, as you had by design, into the way you are releasing your solutions or into the way you are doing your business. So training and capability building around data ethics will be a core component. And also understanding the data ethics dilemmas, because there are a lot of dilemmas and polarities and tensions whenever you're talking about data ethics. There is sometimes no um, black or white or binary components or binary answers to some of those solutions. So that will be quite important to have that debate and discussion. And of course, it would be recommended in that case that the company has a position from the point of view and communicate that position on data ethics to suppliers, to partners and customers so that there's just no guesswork uh, around that. So whenever you are trying to deal with any, you're dealing with any supplier or you're dealing with your partners or even your investors, they know your position as an organization or as a company when it comes to, to data ethics. So the next, please. So when the, you've created this awareness, and this does not mean that these things can't happen in parallel. Actually, they could happen uh, easily in parallel. It would be good to embed data ethics into enterprise ways of, of working and, and governance. And what do we mean by that? Uh, establish ownership, establish accountability uh, around data ethics with the business data owners. Because in most organizations, you would find that they're already data owners or they are system owners and those systems potentially have already data. So it would just be uh, important to, to create that awareness and communication that they are, the element of data ethics is becoming more important and it would be appreciated if they, they, own, they own that. And as well, embed data ethics into overall enterprise policy framework, uh, because I, I can confess that many organization or for instance, in our organization, we are just admitting and having data ethics components built into, into our policy. So it would be also recommended that uh, we, we most organizations do that. And then I think in the ways of working, it is quite uh, advisable or recommended to view data ethics as an asset. You know, if you see it as an asset, as a value adding to the organization, it's creating some level of trust and transparency, depending on, on definitely how, how you define values in your organization. It would be good to tie it to that value. It would be good to see it as an asset. And also it would be uh, good to, to, to demonstrate and communicate that there's a risk tied to it. So if you do not have data ethics practices, which uh, we've defined as some of these principles, then there's some risks that is tied to, to, to that. And therefore there's need for risk assessment and mitigations designed to address those potential risks that would come with lack of uh, weaknesses uh, around data ethics. And that leads me to the third pillar um, or third area where you, it's there's need now to enforcing data ethics into the risk assessments and the controls. Because when you've embedded it into ways of working, when you've created the ownership, when you've operationalized it and there's governance, it would be always good to maintain and extend, put some monitoring in place to ensure that those full spectrum of the seven data ethic principles are at least being lived as designed into the company's position or into the uh, operating framework. And then, of course, it is it would be uh, necessary really to have some health checks um, on that and some function, a function like internal audit or independent review or even second line compliance uh, risk assessment would support 
in, in ensuring that the, those principles for the controls which are defined are being lived uh, within the organization. So these are the three uh, areas uh, um, that we think would be uh, thoughtful to, to have in your consideration as you want to embed data ethics uh, into your enterprise operations. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Back to you, Sophie, and then. John, can I ask you, uh, before we move on to the open Q&A, um, these are very good things to consider, and you're absolutely right that there has to be ownership and accountability at the business level, at the data owner level. But it also seems like perhaps somebody within the organization needs to own the project to implement data ethics. And I was wondering if you or, in fact, any of our other panelists have thoughts about where could that effort be anchored? Should it be compliance? Should it be R&D? Should it be digital? What are the considerations around that? Uh, that that's a that's a very good uh, question, actually. And the, unfortunately, I'll give you the answer that it depends. Um, uh, and I think uh, there's a reason why it depends. Every organization approach this innovative components uh, very differently. So uh, for, for instance, in our case at Novartis, we see it more owned by data science and AI function, which are more responsible for all the data operational data components across the organization. That is from the implementation point of view. From the policy point of view, it will be more owned from ethics, risk and compliance perspective. So for this to be effective, I would just say every organization has to do that assessment and also uh, perform a sort of um, business ethics impact assessment with a RASI chart and therefore place every component where it actually belongs in that organization. But the key point is it has to be a co-creation. It has to be a partnership across the organization. And, and there's just no one part of the organization that would do this alone. So that's the only way that I would, I would, uh, I would recommend or advise on this. I think that makes a lot of sense, John. Uh, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges that organizations might face in trying to operationalize and implement the principles? Yeah, that's another fantastic question, Anna. Um, the, the biggest challenge is, is uh, most likely going to be on the capabilities. So data ethics is not a technical question or a legal question. Data ethics is a multidisciplinary question and there's going to be debates around components related to these principles. And to get a position for the organization, there will be need for most organizations to bring a multidisciplinary committee together to debate these components and agree on their position as an organization. And if the organization would create that infrastructure in place that allows that level of open mindedness and debate on some of this topic, then they will be in a very a sort of um, a manageable smooth journey to realize uh, data ethics. So I think that will be capability, putting a team together that is able to approach and uh, enforce these disciplines and integrate them into the operations over a period of time with some level of patience would create a certain level of success for that organization. But that will be that will be the challenge, but it is doable. Thank you, John. Um, I think there must be questions from the audience. So Sophie, perhaps we hand it back to you and, and also to the rest of our panelists if they have any further thoughts to share on any of these three uh, pillars about how to bed data ethics or really any of the other concepts we've defined so far. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, John and Uma, for your great presentations. Yes, I think this is a good time to ask for questions. We do have um, one section left on implementation, but let's maybe already ask the questions of the of the concepts. So please raise your hand or otherwise write down your question in the chat box. I see a hand raised there, Mara, please go ahead. Mara, I think you're muted. Mara, we cannot hear you. In the meantime, maybe is there anyone else who has a question? I'm sorry. It's go. Mara here. 
I'm connected on two devices. So I made a mistake. <laughs> I don't know if the question is appropriate at this stage as we are going to talk about implementation, but I'd like to learn from the presenters whether within the scope of the how we embed data ethics, we will already need to think about what to do with the data once the project is, complex, is completed. What, what are some of the implications of owning a data, making sure that it's ethical, but what happens once the project ends? What is our responsibility? Thank you. Panelists, feel free to just uh, jump in. I'm not going to play the facilitator. We, we only have 50 minutes left. Anna or John? I can start by, oh, no, there's many people wanting to start. Go ahead, John. <laughs> So uh, that's that's a, a, a very good question, and uh, uh, honestly, it is tied to um, data lifecycle management, which is uh, a component actually of the already existing data governance uh, control frameworks. Uh, so, and if it is not existing, then the organization has to think about the life cycle of data uh, and how they want to deal with the life cycle of data. It is not. Uh, necessarily ve tied to the to 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 the data ethics component, but I think in in future it will start having an influence because of more usability of data and more sharing of data, and that's why again it will come to every organization trying to define their position on reusability and sharing of data uh, going forward. Any other panelists want to comment on this question? Otherwise, we can go for a second question. No to both. Then I would say, Anna, let's move on to the implementation considerations. And we can take further questions after that, of course. Of course, and I think um, many of the things we've discussed so far in terms of how to consider approaching uh, implementing these principles would apply to most of the standards and most of the principles that we might uh, find relevant in our industry. Uh, and I think to some extent uh, these considerations are the same, uh, whether you're talking about human rights, whether you're talking about data ethics, uh, or, or really any other kind of initiative, there are there are certain things that make sense to consider. And so we've listed a few here, and I think we also wanted to open it up to the audience to see if there were any additional considerations that came to your mind as you were listening to the webinar. And John already discussed the need to diversify capabilities and skill sets. This really is an emerging area, and I think we have to draw on multiple disciplines to really be effective in <clears throat> implementing the principles and continuing to iterate them effectively. We talked about tone from the top and maybe one question for the panelists or for the audience is how do you effectively build that data literacy, data ethics literacy? How do you effectively train the, the organization about this? How do you communicate about this? We talked about ensuring input from stakeholders who are working on the data, both in terms of co-creating the more specific policies in your organizations and I think also in actually doing that ethics data ethics impact assessment. One of the principles that Uma covered of course was the need to share data responsibly and so the third parties with whom you exchange data or share data of course are a key stakeholder in this also in a key risk. Um, and then the last two points uh, you know, sometimes get left to the end, but I think they're so critical to think through at the beginning as well. How are we actually going to track and see that the work that we're doing on data ethics is effective, right? All these efforts that we will make in our local organizations over the next coming years to implement the principles, 
How do we know that they're working? How do we know that we are doing the right thing when it comes to data ethics? So I think one is already now starting to think, what are the metrics that might be relevant to track or to report? And then what is our maturity model in terms of how should we progressing in terms of uh, sustainable and responsible data use? So we as a panel might not have the answers to this, um, although we probably have thoughts and, and opinions and I and I would open it up again both to the panelists and to the audience for a further discussion. Anna, Umar here. You raised a great point about, you know, data literacy. Some things that help us really bringing it to life with case studies and examples, myth busters, so that when we are talking of, you know, learnings and trainings, uh, it's not just the principles, but what does it mean for the person in the day to day job? And that I have seen that it helps, you know, when we have a collection and the what does it mean for me could be different depending on the role, you know, the individual is doing. So that's perhaps, you know, something to reflect and consider. So, so Anna, I, I was just going to maybe touch on the the business, the executive buy-in piece. I think um, I was sort of joking at the beginning that it, it no, nobody on this call probably needs to be convinced that this is important. But I think when taken to different organizations, I think laying out um, why uh, this is a, an issue that needs to be addressed, um, which you know, laying out all those implementation factors, it's not an insignificant amount of work. Um, and, you know, in terms of determining who should implement it and who should own the governance in the, in the, in the future and all those kind of those naughty questions that sometimes arise, um, really kind of explaining to everyone in the organization, not just those who are more data literate uh, or attuned to these issues is gonna be very important to get that initial buy-in. Yeah, and maybe to, to just uh, add on that, um, Anna, is um, when, when one of the components is the maturity model, um, which, which I think sometimes um, it's in some fields or some areas, but not in every area. But when it comes to such complex aspect, it would be good to have a, a, a maturity model and some level of patience to monitor how the organization is is progressing and tie those to milestones um, because that's the only way you can measure the metrics and also measure the project and also encourage as well as celeb create celebration points on the progress the organization is making over time yeah john i think to, to you know <laughs> to add to that i think it, it, especially for larger organizations you may find that there is different maturity across different groups, right? So there are groups that are, you know, day to day work with data or data scientists that, you know, they're in one place where, uh, you know, commercial organizations are, you know, relying very much on third parties uh, and maybe not attuned to these issues because it's all happening off prem. So, um, you know, that that's another thing. Even within your organization, there may be some some vast majority different differences that need to be accounted for as you as you kind of consider what, the, what how to kind of progress this. Thank you so much. But we do have a question from the audience uh, from Mexico. Marco, please go ahead. Thank you, Sophie. Um, thank you for the explanation. It seems it's a great work team. So um, I just want to underline that these principles is not just for uh, companies. It applies also to associations. So uh, uh, it, it seems interesting that, uh, of course, we are thinking companies, but it applies uh, to, to, to associations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great point, Marco, for sure. Any other uh, questions to the panel? I don't see anything in the chat, but please just raise your hand. We have a couple of minutes left. Maybe I'll uh, I'll come in with a question. Oh, I'm sorry. There's there is one on the line. I'll save my very difficult question if there's nothing else. <laughs> Juan Francisco, please go ahead. Yes, uh, there is, uh, is uh, a discussion 
about of diversity uh, in the multiclinical trials. But uh, how is uh, uh, understand uh, how to incorporate all kind of discussions in in in, in this um, uh, in the data ethics principles? And the other question is uh, how much of the information uh, it will be available to the public in general. Uh, because there is many organization of the civil society is asking just about the uh, investigation of the pharma companies. That's uh, my question. Those are two very good questions. I, if I understood the first correctly, it was really how to truly ensure diversity and inclusion. Uh, across all parts of data ethics, and and maybe I can start by giving uh, at least part of the answer, and then turn it over uh, to the other panelists. I think it is more than the specific use case of ensuring a diverse population in clinical trials. I think it also is diversity in terms of the skill sets and the backgrounds of the decision makers around data collection and data use, because as Uma pointed out, we do come with biases that dictate how we decide what data should be collected and how we interpret it. Uh, so that's one piece. And then another piece I think that will need to be addressed in much more detail in the AI principles relates to how do you actually build in controls both during the design, the build and the testing and the ongoing operations of your AI to prevent that kind of bias. I think we've seen a number of reports in the news media around where biased AI can really go wrong. And maybe I'll just turn it back to Jeff and, and maybe John and Uma to see if they have further comments on diversity before we come to your second question. You summarized it very well, Anna. The nuances of diversity and the different dimensions, mm -hmm. the skills, capabilities, the thinking people bring to the table. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, excuse me, uh, on the other hand, uh, what about um, of the current context related with the COVID-19? Because um, there is in course many uh, investigations uh, and I don't know how investigations uh, are others to resilience because the, I think that it will be um, the main challenge to the future and how the pharma companies uh, could be to help the, the population the, in this field. Do you know, uh, what is your opinion about it? You know, I can start. COVID has been, I think, an eye-opener, a learning. It has revolutionized, you know, forced a sort of revolutionary thinking, adaptation and ways of working, how pharma companies function with more. And there's also this is what I think is leading to innovative ways to really, you know, not just protect the data, but how we approach day to day working. We think about the balance between focus on the patient, doing it in a sustainable and pragmatic way. So I would say this is still a journey in progress, and that is why having you know discussions like these at fora like ifpma helps also for uh, cross fertilization of best practices so that would be my you know generic thing thank you thank you so much i i, I think uh, also considering that there's no boundaries anymore for information um it is going to to actually open it up for for pharma companies to be very transparent on what they are doing when it comes to data because the societal expectations um, has has really um, grown. Um, everyone all over the world, some a small kid in Rwanda or Uganda could have the same information that someone in the Silicon Valley. So the, the boundaries that were existing before has been disrupted by technology and that forces every pharma company to take 
to, to enable transparency on data and information in a way that it benefits the society. And in return, they also benefit from getting, accessing all this information globally or data globally and using it for their benefits, including in their research or clinical trial. So it's a, it's a win-win actually for pharma companies now to start thinking of being transparent whenever it comes to data and information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, um, Anna, I don't know how you feel. We have we have three minutes left. Um, would you like to take another question or would you like? I just have one final announcement to make, um, but that's quick. So up to you. It seems like we have one question on the chat, which is how data ethics might change in this uh, context of uh, patients really wanting to own their own health data, partly blockchain, but partly some of the advances in terms of personalized medicine and, and, and uh, e-devices supporting healthcare. And I don't know if uh, anyone on, on the line has a thought on that. That's certainly something we could tackle in two minutes. I mean, that's, that's a, <laughs> I mean, I, I think there's, there, it's a great question. I mean, I think many of the, I, I would just say that many of the, the principles we've laid out here will be applicable um you know in that context right and i think what we want to do and 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 what we want to do as as our members want to do as they implement this is to do it in a way that recognizes how quickly this space is going to evolve um so i'm not sure that's a, a direct answer to that question but that you know that i think we need to be flexible and it goes back to you know the question of why now for the for this i think there's lots of reasons now but a lot of a lot of just understanding that things are going to continue to evolve both from a technology perspective and a regulatory expectation expect ex, you know perspective as well and from a societal perspective because the way that people now think about owning their data will also evolve and I think that the principles hopefully uh, recognize both the importance of the individual at the center and so are very aligned with the idea that people own their data, whether it's health data or not, and with the important societal implications and societal benefits of using that data and sharing that data. And that will probably be part of the transparency uh, efforts that the industry has to make, not only to explain how do we use your data, but how do we use the data for good? And that I would say, Anna, is a very nice final final statement. Uh, of course, as I said in the beginning, please feel free to send your questions if you have any after the webinar to me. Um, I just wanted to talk very quickly about this. Um, and many of you will know, and the panelists have already mentioned it several times, AI guidance, that's our next um, topic that we will tackle with this working group. Um, but the WHO has been working on this, of course, as well, and they will actually launch on Monday their report um, on ethics and governance of AI for health. Um, some of you will know Julian Durant, who is on the right hand side in the little frame. He is actually representing the industry in this expert panel as an observer. And uh, it's very important for us to have him there because, as many of you know, the relationships with the WHO are not always um, without uh, contentious um, issues. So here we're very happy to have him. And uh, he had yesterday a debrief with Dr. Uh, Tedros, who is uh, the, the director general of the WHO. So just wanted to show you this and I will send it out per email as well. You can join, everyone can join that um, soft launch on Monday. It's uh, midday uh, CET time and um, you can see the panelists there as well. So I think this is going to be an important launch and we will then work together with, with the, the, the experts of today and, and, and additional people of the working groups that will be added to this um, very important topic as well. And hopefully, I don't know, we, don't, we did not set a timeline, but hopefully we can do the same agile and really quick um, guidance as we did with this very topic of data ethics and I have to say I'm super proud and super pleased with the outcome. It's been a pleasure to work with all of you and I thank all the panelists for um, speaking uh, to us today. I thank you also audience for coming to this webinar 
And um, with that, I wish all of us a very nice uh, afternoon, rest of the day, evening, a nice weekend. And please do follow up if you have any outstanding questions. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.